This is the State of Things from the American Tobacco Historic District. I'm Frank Stacio. Pam Spaulding calls herself an accidental activist. She's not an activist in the traditional sense. She hasn't run for office, and she's not part of an advocacy group. But online, Pam runs a progressive political blog. She's created a space where writers gather to share their opinions. It's called Pam's House Blend. Most of Pam's activism has been targeted towards civil rights for the LGBT community. But since the tragedy last Friday in Newtown, Connecticut, Pam has discussed the shooting as well. Pam Spaulding is my guest this hour. Welcome to the State of Things. Good day. Thank you, Frank. Thanks for having me on. Your site is called Pam's House Blend. What uh, what material do you usually cover? LGBT rights, um, reproductive freedom, uh, the religious right, and usually just current events as they come up that interest me. And, of course, the, the current event now is uh, is Newtown, Connecticut. Wow. What kind of responses have you gotten, and how have you responded to that tragedy? Well, on social media, where I reside a lot of the time, it's been very uh, interesting to see the anger, uh, both from gun rights advocates and um, gun control advocates. And I've tended to stay away from that because I think the larger picture that needs to be discussed is how mental illness is and is not addressed in this nation. You did write about that, and your concern is that it is not addressed very directly. T- tell about that. Tell us more. Well, uh, primarily because mental illness is not treated in the same way as a chronic condition such as diabetes. Uh, it's tended to be uh, hidden in shame, uh, blame of the of the person who's suffering from it, and there's just a lack of access to resources that are available for people. Our mental health care system is wonderful if you have access to it. Uh, But I think for the majority of Americans who are still uncomfortable with the idea of addressing it, particularly in family situations where you might be dealing with children you know are at risk, uh, they're they're not getting to those resources at all. No, it's amazing. I mean, we've got a mental health care system and a health care system that technologically, uh, you know, we're on the cutting edge. We're advanced. We're the best in the world. And yet we constantly hear stories about people not having access, people on the margins. This is a middle-class family, and we understand that... uh, that uh, Nancy Lanza found it very difficult to get help in the school system, and, and she felt very much alone. This is a white middle-class family. Right. It doesn't really matter if the, uh, the institutions, such as schools, uh, have a hard time because they have to deal with all the rest of those children in the classroom. Many of them are suffering from uh, illnesses of one form or another, ADHD, autism, Those things are not necessarily any predictor of any kind of violence, but for those kids who are behavioral risks, they have to be separated out, and how do you deal with them so that they get the proper education and proper mental health care? That takes the help of the school and the family. Well, you really, and I think your blog is well-situated to talk about an issue like this because most of the time you're talking about communities who are marginalized, who find themselves outside the mainstream um, because of the way they are talked about. And in this case, again, we're talking about middle class people who are both victims and and the shooter in this case, who find themselves on the margins and and maybe didn't understand how we we're all marginalized in many ways in this in this social order and economic order. That's right, because if you are first, you know, feeling that you can't talk about the problem at all, how can you ask for help? And if you feel that it's somewhat spiraled out of control in your household, you're even more at risk for not wanting to discuss it because you felt that it's not been attended to. So you tend to feel isolated and alone. And when that happens, you are in a danger area. So you talked about mental health, and that was something that, that you, in a sense, initiated because, as you said, you're very active in social media, and it was suddenly ablaze with arguments, mostly over gun control, to characterize that. And, and your reaction to it, how, how quickly and, and the velocity with which that conversation was carried on. I really refuse to engage in that discussion. And uh, on my Facebook wall, where people can post uh, anything they wish, I have it open, I don't have it closed from the public, uh, it tended to be very civil, uh, because I, I don't tolerate you know personal attacks. Uh, but when I was looking out on my feed where anyone is posting for anybody else whose page is open, there were just personal attacks, very um, irrational, uh, profane attacks on one another. And it was because they're at polar opposites in their positions. 
Uh, this is why politicians are scared to do anything, quite frankly. Uh, so I stayed away from that and focused on mental illness and the fact that we have a real hair trigger temper culture in American society. Uh, just look at Canada where guns are prevalent. You do not see the level of violence that you do here. So I think there needs to be a rational discussion about why is that? Why is our culture so violent, so easy to you know, have road rage incidents, um, incidents where domestic violence, someone's pulling out a weapon. Uh, there's something very disturbing about our culture. Well, talk about the the scope of that, because certainly a, a, a tragic event like this focuses our attention. But every day in the streets of cities all over America, we're seeing domestic violence, gun violence of all kinds, and and real tragedies where whole families are being lost on a regular basis. Absolutely. I mean, if you talk about drive-by shootings, shootings in public places, I mean, in the wake of this, you're seeing lots of news stories being publicized about a shooting at a mall or a shooting in a church or things that are happening on a day-to-day basis that just don't rise to the level of newsworthiness because it's not a mow-down of, of dozens of people. Uh, it's sad that that really raises the, the temperature so that you actually have politicians right. talking about it. But that shows you that we've become somewhat immune to violence and even incidents of domestic violence. I think that that's a very frightening uh, kind of numbness that has come over the, the culture. So you raised two questions there. Let's take them one at a time. The, the, the numbness, which I'll get to in a moment, the, our, our insens- growing insensitivity or apparent insensitivity to violence. But the source of this violence, what is going on? We don't see this kind of violence in other cultures, or we don't certainly hear about it. it it's clear that th- something is going on. I think it's, a, you know, this is just my speculation, but I think it is a response to um, a very polarizing political culture where people are feel that they need to be on one side of an issue or another and, and not work things out. After all, look at Congress. They can't work out anything. Um, but also just the natural day-to-day stresses of trying to maintain a household. At one point in time, probably when I was a little girl and younger, uh, you could raise a family on one income. But now you have two parents working, uh, latchkey kids, uh, kids who are, have to be out of school and there's nothing for them to do if they live in an, in a, in an area where there is a lot of risk factors to be exposed to violence. And I think that that has taken its toll. When you live in, like I said, Appalachia, where there's just not a lot of job opportunities, that is a that is a recipe for domestic violence. And it's certainly, yeah, it's not, it, this is not a racialized issue. Poor people across this country are living in communities, cul-de-sacs now, economic cul-de-sacs that are growing, where all kinds of abuse uh, and families are being destroyed. Lives are nearly hopeless. If you can get, if you've traveled to various corners of this of this country, you're going to see elements of this in black and white. And it really does is kind of a class divide as much as a race divide. It is. If you're in a middle class uh, family with you know people with two jobs or even a person with a great job and great health insurance, you have access to those mental health services. You may be more educated in how to re- reach those services and talk to medical professionals because I think our healthcare system doesn't, while it's great, doesn't help in that if you've got a, only a 10 or 15 minute visit with a doctor, you better be a very informed consumer when you go in there about what's wrong with you and what is, what is it that you need to have attended to. A lot of people aren't educated on how to do that. And so we we don't get that one-to-one relationship with a doctor that we used to have long ago uh, to help facilitate them identifying, say, problems with a child that you might want to get move them and get them over to another healthcare professional. What about these conversations that we are having, the, the polarized, angry conversations about gun control? Do you think in some ways they're surrogates, that they become the thing we want to talk about because we've already figured out our position on it, um, and they become a surrogate conversation that keeps us from ever having uh, and, and ever engaging some of these deeper questions? Oh, absolutely. On social media, that would be considered a silencing tactic, is that you get people so overheated that they just abandon the conversation. And this is a particularly true on any hot topics. Anytime I talk about race, uh, usually reproductive freedom, certainly gun rights, though I don't talk, speak about that very often, but those tend to shut down very quickly because people want to abandon without getting personally attacked. Um, while people on television can handle being uh, having things thrown at them <laughs> uh, in terms of personal attacks, most people bail 
rather than share their opinions after it, after it gets too heated. So I want to find out a little bit more about how you came to start this blog and, and get uh, some of your personal history. You went to Catholic school here and then a kind of a specialized public school. So tell me tell me about your education. Well, I went uh, K through 6 in Immaculata here in Durham. A wonderful experience in what is a very different time in, under the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, we actually sang uh, Pete Seeger songs in class mm-hmm. and it was very progressive mm-hmm. at the time. I actually had my first grade uh, teacher who was a nun actually leave the order to get married. Uh, so mm-hmm. <laughs> exposed to a very different um, church than I have to deal with when I'm talking about blogging and yeah. LGBT equality now. You went there and uh, and then went to New York to f- to finish your education or at least your elementary, secondary education. Yes, I went to high school at Stuyvesant High School in New York City in Manhattan. That's one of the specialized high schools you have to take a test to get into. I didn't study for the test, so I wonder how I managed it. <laughs> but anyway. That's probably yeah. <laughs> but it was a very uh, informing education for me. I was a student of Frank McCourt who wrote Angela's Ashes. Oh. Uh, But what I loved about my high school experience is that I was exposed to so many people from so many different countries, religious backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds. And I think that helped inform me about how I blog now, about how I see um, uniting people rather than dividing people. Because I had – you know how they talk about the divided lunchroom where people divide by race or whatever? Well, my my table was the oddball table out. We were all real geeky and we came from all different parts of the world and and, and cultures. And I guess what was was the same about all of us is we were interested in people who are different than they were. Mm. Um, well, we'll talk more about that, how you can speak with conviction, write with conviction, and still with the intention of bringing people together and not polarizing. It's a very difficult, narrow road, and we'll talk about how you do it when our conversation with Pam Spaulding continues, the editor of Pam's House Blend. That conversation continues on the State of Things from North Carolina Public Radio, a broadcast service of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Please stay tuned. This is the State of Things broadcasting from the American Tobacco Historic District. I'm Frank Stacio. Today, talking with Pam Spaulding, editor of the blog Pam's House Blend, and Pam Spaulding, a member of the prominent Spaulding family of Durham. Uh, tell us a little bit about your lineage. Uh, well, um, some of my uh, relatives way back in the day founded North Carolina Mutual Life Insurance Company, which at the time was the largest black business on the planet. Um, and uh, my relatives, my grandmother and grandfather, both served uh, on the county commission in Durham and were involved in politics. Uh, my grandmother, Elna, founded Women in Action for the Branson's Prevention of Violence and His Causes, which uh, did a lot of work during the civil rights era to help uh, keep the peace by bringing together black and white women of the time uh, to discuss racial relations. Let's talk a little bit about those those institutions and about your grandmother, that North Carolina Mutual uh, and the Spaulding family and other families around that time, we're talking the turn of the 20th century, um, did a lot to create essentially a black middle class in the city of Durham. Is that right? That's right. And um, I think that that's one of the things that you can really be proud of because uh, even today, uh, unfortunately, you hear a lot of people... Uh, talking about black people as if you're all one <laughs> one mm-hmm. monolith, yeah. as if there isn't a black middle class. Yes, there is an underclass, just as there is in in in, in the white community, yeah. uh, that needs attending to. But there is a, a black middle class that was raised up during the early part of the 20th century, and and as people migrated to jobs in the north, um, established a good black middle class, and that would be true of my my mother's side of the family in New York. Tell us about, a little bit more about Elna, too, your grandmother who uh, and her organization and, and the impact that had on you uh, or, or does it as, as a blogger. But w- I think we'll need to know a little bit about more about her organization. Well, just the fact that it worked between uniting communities and helping at the root level talk one-on-one with, with one another about race relations, it does. <laughs> I think that the, the big key is something that I've learned about that is that you can't talk it, talk it, unless you walk it. Mm. Um, there are many people that I, I talk to on my blog who don't have any black friends, for instance, yet they're very easy to pontificate about race and <laughs> race relations. Like, well, if you don't know anyone who's different from yourself, how can you even ask questions uh, of substance because you, of the fear of a bad reaction from someone? Right. And I think one-on-one conversations make a big difference. And that's something I learned from that in, in my discussions with other people. Uh, and deciding to blog, I just found it ironic that I never thought about my political family lineage and t- until I started writing 
And then I realized that I'm just doing a different form of activism in a different venue, but it's much the same kind of thing. Well, tell us more about about Elna's activities and the activity of that group uh, in in particular. Because, and she was the first African American woman on the uh, on the county commission. Is that mm-hmm. right? That's correct. Yeah. And so you have to think about what was that like in that time, which was the 1970s. 70s. All right. Um, and I think that says a lot about the city of Durham. I'm very proud to have that as my hometown and I still live here, is that uh, progressive activism has come a long way. And I think that it's always been part of the mainstay of this city. And it, it reminds me that um, the foundation that was laid by my grandmother and other activists of the time are show you what a dark blue city this is and that it comes to... Um, lead in forms of progressive activism and politics. Uh, I wish the rest of the state would follow that model, but uh, we're getting there. Um, and her work is part of that act- legacy. Well, and it, but it, but it talks about bringing people together. I think to, because if you're if you if you are, you know are part of the red now majority of the state, you say, well, I don't want to be that way, Pam. Thanks very much, but we actually think we're right. So you know, um, thanks for your opinion. Well, you know what. Uh, they're going to be coming my way whether they like it or not. Uh, the demographics are showing the difference. And, and I've been telling my friends, particularly ones who are in the North, uh, blogger friends of mine who just said, oh, you know, oh, Amendment 1 passed. That's just how, Dor- you know, how North Carolina mm-hmm. is. It's a red state. And I point out to them the reason why it was red and it went for Romney uh, in 2012 is because of the 2010 elections. Uh, unfortunately, there were too many progressive and moderate people asleep at the wheel and that and the Tea Party uh, activists did their job and that uh, set the stage for redistricting. Um, so there are a lot of other background things that led to it turn around, but I think culturally the, the, the state is changing and those who feel comfortable right now in their red bliss are not going to be that way for very long. Tell us more about about going to New York. You said you went to Stuyvesant, which is a, a very good high school. It's a school that you have to pass an entrance exam to get into, and you had a good experience there. Mm -hmm. But then in New York City, you you weren't as comfortable there uh, over time. Well, (laughs) it was a very dangerous place to live at that point in time. Uh, Although looking back on it now, I think I'm more terrified now than I was at the time when you're living there because, I mean, you had to take the train to school. The train was graffiti-laden, chain snatchings, you know, muggings every day. Uh, it It was a cesspool of violence. Uh, but <laughs> but what it taught me was um, I can't stay there forever. I mean, I, I loved having the professional experience of getting into publishing in New York, which was its own story. Uh, but when I when I my mother got mugged uh, and knocked to the ground, and then my brother was held up at gunpoint in our neighborhood, I figured my time was nearly up, and so I decided to pick up and leave. You also said that uh, New York City was more segregated than Durham. Oh, that's I think that's still true now. Um, the the fact is it I call it the most racist city that I've ever lived in, and I think that's still true. I mean, it was very clear. My mother made it very clear to me where I could and couldn't go at night in New York. I was not going to head out to Bay Ridge or Bensonhurst or Howard Beach. I'm sure some people may have heard mm-hmm. of those areas of Brooklyn, uh, where if you were black, it was a sundown town. You needed to get out before sundown because you were at risk uh, at being racially, um, ha- being the target of violence. Um, so growing up in that environment, especially, and we're talking 76 to 89, uh, I lived in Bedford Stuyvesant and it was never a given that if you called the police that they were actually going to show up. Mm -hmm. And if they did show up, they may come out and start shooting at or beating up the victim of violence rather than looking for the person who did black on black crime. How do you know who the victim is? Right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, and when they weren't doing that, they were driving by where there were open air drug deals. So New York was a really polarizing place at the time. It's less so now because I go back to my neighborhood in Bedford Stuyvesant. It's completely gentrified. You can't touch a home without $800,000 in your pocket. Uh, so New York has changed only because of the economic climate. People need to find a place to live and it's going to be in the outer boroughs. Tell us about getting into publishing because you did do that when you were in New York. Yeah, um, I had a BA in media studies at Fordham and uh, did filmmaking. But of course, you have to actually earn a living to live in New York. And I went to work for Travel Agent Magazine when publishing meant that you actually had to have a typesetter in house. Uh, They had to, um, I used a Vera typer. And I was trying to think of a couple of the names of the other brands of typesetting equipment that I actually used. 
and you print perhaps an exacto knife. <laughs> well, the exacto knife came after the repro, which was the, <laughs> the printed copy that you produced came out, and you had to cut the repro with an exacto knife and paste it on cardboard. There you go. <laughs> that was publishing back in the day, and then you sent that to a printer, and then it came back, uh, and then you had to see if there were any typos, and if there were any typos, you had to find. Say there was an E where there needed to be an A. You'd have to go find an old piece of repro, use your X-Acto knife, cut out the A, and paste it over the E. I can safely say, actually, when I came uh, down here to work um, as a production editor at uh, Duke University Press, we were still doing that. Wow. So, but you did learn. And, yes, and, I did And learn. trial by fire. Tell us about how the uh, the Macintosh computer changed your life. Well, I was a travel agent. Uh, the, the bosses had a, a meeting, called us all in the typesetters, and the uh, copy desk editors. That By that time, I had to move to the copy desk. And we had these brand spanking new Macintosh 2 uh, <laughs> computers sitting on the desks. And I believe they, they had a half meg of RAM. <laughs> I think we had two. Ooh, and PageMaker, and PageMaker 1.0. Mm. And um, they said, we're going to sit you all down and train you on these. And the people who take, take this and are able to run with this get to keep your jobs. Wow. Yeah, so it was, it was pretty black and white. And the irony is none of the typesetters were able to mm. keep their jobs. All the copy desk editors did a better job. And I'm not sure what that's about. I mean, typesetting at that time was really code-driven. And when you were learning how to do desktop publishing, it was very what you see is what you get. It's mm. called WYSIWYG. So you could see what you were doing on screen. And I'm not sure why that transition was so difficult. But, of course, you know, designers all do it now on, on computer. So you did that, and then how long did you stay there under the new under the new system? I was there a total of about six years. Uh, I left, was a proofreader somewhere else, and then came back again. And it was at that job that I finally left and came back to Durham. And and did you decide to come back to Durham? I mean, obviously there were some pressures to leave New York. You talked a little bit about those, but was there also an attraction to Durham? No. Well, the crime and grime was reason number one. Right. Uh, but then I wanted to come back to someplace familiar. I mean, it's easy to move pa- come back to someplace familiar, although I have to say coming back, Durham was a much different place than when I had left. Uh, How so? Oh, well, just the, the changes that had occurred. I and mean, so when did you come back then? 1989. 89, all right. So when I left, Durham had one terminal at its airport, RDU. <laughs> uh, you could walk out to the tarmac and go to the planes. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a new wing. And actually, by now, we have, are closing the, that existing wing and have two new terminals. Uh, there was The Durham Freeway didn't go all the way through town. Um, South Square was just you know fairly new. Uh, that's a mall that's in southern Durham. Um, and it just felt like a much different place because there were many more people who had Yankees who had traveled down from the north to come work here. Um, and the culture was different. Like you couldn't get a bagel here when I left, but you could find a bagel when you when I got back. Well, and also talking about uh, South Wing and South Point, they're now what we consider the southern edge of Durham. You lived in what was then the, the southern. So talk about your neighborhood and it's being the southern frontier of the city of Durham. That's right. I lived in uh, Emory Wood Estates, which still exists um, down in Durham. And I guess would be the midpoint practically of Durham at this point, just outside of downtown. But it was the southernmost point of the city. And it was home to um, middle class black families at the time. And I remember my mother taking me out to go to the country, which was just down Fayetteville Road, and you kept driving what seemed like an eternity, which was probably only a couple of miles, where I could go to a farm and get some chicken eggs, you know, and raise little <laughs> little chicks. Um, so it was surprising to come back and see how far it had expanded. Uh, Southern, uh, I think um, just not long after I returned, uh, Durham had in- enveloped uh, Parkwood, oh. which was a neighborhood that was outside of its own sort of small municipality. And then uh, South Point, uh, the, the advent of South Point really showed me how fast Durham is growing. Very growing, very quickly. You got back here. And uh, your first job back here, African News Service, was that right? I worked at the Forest History Society for a short time, doing some work there, uh, but then moved back into directly into publishing at African News Service, which at that point um, was small, but they were doing actually technology uh, things that were surprising at the time, and I, I look back at them and it seemed quaint, but use of satellite phones from third world countries uh, was done uh, quite frequently. Uh, when you signed on to uh, CompuServe, do people remember what that is, <laughs> uh, to, we would use that to upload and download stories that I would then take and put on um, the Macintosh computer and compose them in desktop publishing software. 
um, and again drove the drove the uh, things out to the printer to get them printed. Uh, so just watching the evolution of um, journalism and publishing uh, over my career has been very interesting. Well, you can talk to us a little bit about that. African News Service, was this a, a satellite office? Was it centered here? It was an office that actually uh, lived in the basement of the Regulator bookstore on 9th Street in Durham. Um, and why was it here? Why was there an office here in Durham? Well, I don't know why. I think uh, Reed Kramer and, uh, <laughs> and Tammy, they they had it out, out here. I think they were Duke graduates, and they actually decided to do this. And they did some great journalism out of that little little shop. I mean, you really it was internationally known and recognized, right. which was fantastic. But I just think about how the back end operation of it yeah. uh, is it's it was cut and paste um, to get it out in in the open, but yet it was still guided by uh, technology changes that were, were on, being undergoing at that time. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, you couldn't have done that uh, ten years earlier. It mm-hmm. would have been impossible to. You wouldn't think of developing an international news service out of a basement in Durham. Because you just could, you, you couldn't pull the resources together, right? And I just think we had like a twenty-four baud modem, uh, which wow. <laughs> yeah. it took a long time to transmit a story. But you know what? You're able to do it. What um, kind of stories were you reporting, or were your reporters reporting? Um, they were talking about violence in certain countries, certain corruption in administrations in, in African nations, talking about um, famine, um, also about good works that were being done and progress being made in some of the countries there. Uh, I think it was an eye-opening experience for me because I hadn't, you know, paid much attention to that continent and all of the news that was being generated out of there. But it was extremely interesting to see that. So, and and now, if you think about the way the market for that kind and the appetite for that kind of news, which was very small, I would think, and young at the time, and now it's exploded, and we expect to see wor- news of the world every day, kind of every minute, at our desktop or on our phones. Right, and the, and the issue is now is you don't have to be a professional journalist to do this. I mean, a lot of people are blogging, are using social media out of third world nations. Um, Internet access is prevalent in a lot of places. Uh, And that's where you see a lot of social activism. You see a lot of social movements and social justice movements getting attention that never would have um, because they were in faraway places and only being published in small venues. Are they bringing the, those issues to the attention of people who were unaware? I, I'm trying to think, you know, the big criticism, of course, about social media is that it's the converted speaking among themselves. And so that there isn't really a broader awareness. Everybody's in their own silo, seeking their own information, seeking their own validation for the opinions they already have. That's the criticism. Um, I would agree with that, with the exception of people like me. I want to learn about things that are not within my comfort zone. And I always refer to the comfort zone as that. It's a lot easier to be about people, be among people who think just like you do or look just like you than to try to expand your thinking and actually feel uncomfortable in situations about things that, well, you're not familiar with and they make you queasy in some kind of way, but you're not sure why. Well, does that happen with you? I mean, you, you have convictions. You have definite ideas about marriage rights and about the rights for, uh, for uh, LGBT communities. Um, and you uh, deep convictions. Uh, what Then where's the openness? What is the example of your saying, well, you know what? I'm a little uncomfortable with this position, but I'm going to explore it. Oh, well, I've actually sat down with people who oppose marriage equality and talked to them. I actually had a decent conversation with Reverend Patrick Wooden, who uh, is a very staunch supporter of Amendment 1, um, and I disagree with him on just about every point. But I did, in our conversation, I did actually get him to admit that it's probably not fair for someone to be fired for being gay. I'd never heard him say that before. And then, contrary to popular opinion, I actually have quite a few Republican friends, and we have actually civil conversations about it because I do believe that the only way to have full success across the political spectrum is if you have strength in both parties. You can't have all of the people on the left in the Democratic Party and all the people on the right in the Republican Party. There's a very small sense that there's any place to be in the middle. Um, And I talk to people who believe in marriage equality who are Republican. I think that you just have to figure out how do you let the extreme efforts on either side see that there is is ability to compromise without losing conviction? Well, politics has become a kind of zero-sum game, and all of the issues are framed that way. And you had a, a post on your blog recently that talked about the oppression Olympics, this idea that rights is a kind of limited resource, and if some got them, some ain't. Right. And the post was about a a journalist who was writing a piece about the Supreme Court and the fact that there are cases before the court that are about um, affirmative action. And there are also cases about marriage equality that the the Supreme Court will have to decide upon. And it was framed as if the 
rights of brown people are somehow going to be affected by uh, obtaining rights if you are LGBT if they move to marriage equality. And I was like, that doesn't even make any sense. Uh, one, they're two; they're different cases. And not only that, what happens to the the sense of intersectionality? I happen to be black and I happen to be a lesbian. <laughs> Is there some way I have to split the baby on this? Because it makes no sense. But the idea that there are groups that have to fight amongst themselves to obtain civil rights or civil liberties is just senseless and unnecessary. Well, the court certainly isn't considering a question about whether or not if, if we allow marriage equality, then we will have to take away um, affirmative action rights. I mean, it's not like we're, some, we're all standing in the court screaming, give us Barabbas. <laughs> it's not that kind of choice. No, but why is it being framed that yeah. way? You have to ask, what is it in, in the interest of any journalist to try to portray them that way? Uh, and I think it goes back to your point about polarization. It, it, there has to be some sensationalistic aspect of journalism, journalism to be noticed now so that people feel they have to take sides. They have to you know, go on to Twitter and Facebook and just open fire. Unfortunately, that's a bad yeah. metaphor. But yes, but that's what they're doing. And it is not. It's not working. It's not working for me. So polarization is one question. Numbness, which we talked about earlier, is another. And I want to talk more about that when our conversation continues. I'm talking to Pam Spaulding, editor of the blog Pam's House Blend. And we'll have more after this break. Stay tuned. This is The State of Things. I'm Frank Stacio. Today, talking with accidental activist Pam Spaulding, editor of Pam's House Blend. We've been talking about the way issues are framed, particularly those of civil rights, as as though they were a kind of zero-sum game, more for you, less for me. Um, But the other question that we talked about very early in the program was whether we're becoming desensitized, whether it just takes more and more to activate our imaginations and get us to feel like we should do something about it. I mean, do do you think that's happening? Yeah, I think we're just as a general coarseness that's going through our society that not only is it coarseness, but lack of attention span. I mean, I think that people really want things in sound bites and want to be able to figure out where do they stand on an issue very quickly so that they can respond. Um, and then there are the people who just tune out, period. I'm, I've, I've talked to people who have just tuned out from news, um, which fortunately leaves them not knowing much about decisions being made on their behalf. Um, I'm very concerned about people who just aren't voting. Right. Why well, are they tuned out? Is there antidote for this? Um, you know, I'm not sure. If I had, if yeah. anybody had an answer, we would have already <laughs> explored that. But I think that there are not enough people actually speaking to one another one to one. I find that the people who respond on social media, for instance, they can hide behind anonymity. Um, and throw any kind of bombs at one another. But I think that we would be much more productive if we went out and had lunch with one another, you know, pick someone that you know that's on your friends list that doesn't agree with you and actually speak about the issues over lunch where you really can't escape right. uh, knowing someone as a human being. Well, that's it. When you're sitting across from someone, A, you're not going to use that kind of language. B, you're going to have to be somewhat sensitive to where what they're saying and where it comes from. Mm-hmm. And you'll probably ask a little bit about that. Like, why is it that you feel that way? And that becomes a much more humane. So I guess the, the question then is – Back to the original question. Now we can reframe it. Um, are we inside? Does it make it too easy for us to develop and nurture a kind of thinking, a kind of either or thinking? Because we can tweet just 140 characters. We can hide behind our our uh, our you know name on online, our online name, online identity. Uh, I think that we can get beyond it. I think that it, we need some leadership on this issue because uh-huh. I really think nothing in our media supports. Uh, thinking. You know, I think we're being told what to think a lot of the time, and there's not a lot of analysis. Um, And the fact that polarization even exists in what you do choose to read for your news sources uh, makes a difference uh, altogether. I mean, I think there's accusations that, you know, maybe CNN or MSNBC are too much to the left or the right, but we all know that Fox News has a particular point of view. Well, if any one audience chooses to select only one source of news, uh, you come away with a skewed perspective. Uh, and I find that a lot of people have no idea what's going on locally. They haven't, don't know who their elected official is. I, I think there's just it's, it's a plethora of things that we have to deal with to help people feel more educated. I, I almost have the sense that before we had information overload, people had a better understanding of the world around yeah. them in some ways. Well, tell us about the start of your blog, Pam's House Plan. How did it get going? Uh, it started in, in 2004, and I was really just writing diaries aloud, thinking aloud about the Bush administration then in the in the throes of running for re-election. 
uh, using marriage amendments um, and anti-gay propaganda, uh, official propaganda out of the Republican Party to demonize uh, the LGBT community uh, to win, uh, which shows you how far we've come in just a short amount of time that, you know, we have marriage equality winning <laughs> in several states. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at that time, I was just very angry and very depressed that I was being seen as something evil or wrong. Or, and it, and it, that wasn't my experience in living my life day to day. But the fact that you had political leaders trying to, to do that made me very upset. And so I was just blogging, not expecting anyone to comment, and didn't even think that the comment feature was actually working on my blog. <laughs> um, and every once in a while, I would get a comment. And um, when I tell people who want to start a blog, uh, how did you do it? Uh, I say the part of the issue is I started so long ago, uh, back mm-hmm. when there were fewer bloggers, fewer blogs. I could go and post a diary on Daily Coast, which is like the largest trafficked uh, progressive blog on the, on the planet, um, and someone would actually read it. I mean, right now, if you post a diary, there's no guarantee anyone will read it because so many are being posted. So right. that that made a difference. But when I started to get readers, it, it shocked me that anyone would respond to what I had to write. And how has the, the industry, as it were, changed since you started? I mean, that's one, obviously, the just sheer volume. Mm-hmm. Um, what else? Um I think that there's this divide between the professionalism, professionalization of blogs um, and the independent bloggers who are just sort of struggling to survive right now. Um, most of the big bloggers, um, some of them have been pluck, plucked off and, and taken off by um, traditional media and installed as their in, institutional bloggers. Um, Others have decided to stay and forge their own territory in the Internet. But largely, the advertising market for blogs um, doesn't lend itself to, to have that as your primary job if you're an independent blogger. Um, you have to chase ads and hope that they will sustain your blog. But I never even attempted that. I always had a full-time job and thought of my blog as just an expression of uh, what I had to say. And then when I brought other bloggers to participate, what they had to say, because I I'd enjoyed having perspectives of people who are not like me. I have a transgender blogger, Autumn Sandine, um, who was one of the people chained to the White House fence uh, for the Don't Ask, Don't Tell during that period, um, showing us what activism is like from other perspectives. You uh, you uh, identify as gay. Did you have a hard time coming out? Did Did your coming to terms with your gender identity, was that a struggle for you? No, not at all. I mean, um, coming out as a lesbian, um, even though I guess you hear so many horror stories about coming out and you know being rejected by your your family and friends, and um, I came out fairly late. I was twenty nine, and when I came out to my mom, she had the re- the reaction probably some others can uh, <laughs> identify with. I will never have any grandchildren. Uh, <laughs> you will never get married. Uh, okay, well, she doesn't. She didn't have any grandchildren from me, but my brother did. Um, but and you are married. I am married, and I'm legally married because I married my wife, Kate, in, in uh, Vancouver, Canada in 2004. It's just not recognized by the state of North Carolina. And depending on what city I land in, I'm married or have a civil union uh, or I'm a, in a domestic partnership, which is one of the reasons why uh, DOMA must fall. Um, but um, when I came out to my brother, it was not a big deal at all. Uh, so I, I have to say mine is atypical, uh, coming out at, at the age that I did and the time that I did. Uh, but I think one of the things that made the biggest difference in my ability to accept who I was is that my family was not particularly religious. Um, there was, though I am Episcopalian um, and was confirmed, uh, we didn't attend church regularly, and there was never a sense in in our household that the demonization of gays or damnation or hell, you're hell bound or anything like that. So I never had that to work against. That is not the story that I heard from many many readers that 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 has played a large role in in how they feel about church in general um, and how they feel about themselves. Well, and you put your finger on something there, too, is because of the number of identities that we have to navigate. There is our political identity, a religious identity, and all these things can fairly well be integrated until issues like this, you know, raise themselves. And as a black woman, as a lesbian, you're having to navigate a racial identity and and a gender identity that uh, are within black communities sometimes uh, difficult and can be in conflict. And that's why I tell people the the especially here in, in North Carolina, and it's still the South, may not be the deep South, but it's still the South, the most important thing that people can do is come out of the closet. Um, I think that for the black community or communities of color generally, you see fewer out gay people here. Um, I think that if you saw more out in the community, 
talking to your neighbors, you know, being with your partner and being out, that would that would take away a lot of the cutting problems that we have here. Now, the reason why it doesn't happen in North Carolina is because you could still be fired for being LGBT. Uh, there's no state law pre- preventing us uh, from being fired. Uh, but we have to know, and everybody does know, there are plenty of corporations here where there are protections that people can be out of the closet and live their lives out, yet they're still closeted. The the idea that you can be socially out on the weekends and then you're back in the closet during the week, that's something that we have to get rid of. Um, well, the, and the other aspect of being out, and I think you, you did touch on it, is once you get to know people, again, you, you sort of, you uh, eliminate the rigid lines between these identities. So if you thought you were a religious conservative who could not conscience, um, homosexuality at any level and find out that you have a nephew and a friend and all, then, then there would be something tempered about that religious identity. You could still be a religious conservative, uh, absolutely worship that way, but something has changed because of your friends and family that you now know are, are uh, LGBT. Right, and there is there is a religious separation of church and state, and I think that you can believe what you want to believe about your religious marriage and who marries in your church, but that's definitely different than what your civil law is and what do you enshrine in your constitution as discriminatory. Uh, I think it choose, this at least Amendment 1 opened a conversation that did not occur before. My only regret is that it, the ballot initiative happened when it did. I mean, it, obviously, we hadn't had time to even have a discussion and not enough time before that uh, amendment was put before us. But that had nothing to do with anything I would have ever done. Do you see any effort to counter that? It's pretty difficult. It's a constitutional amendment. What would be the strategy? Well, the strategy is you sit tight and wait for the Supreme Court to overturn it and and uh, and declare that it's unconstitutional. Uh, so that would be just like Lawrence versus Virginia. Uh, I mean, is that right? Loving, loving versus Virginia. Loving, yeah. Uh, sorry about that, but um, okay. yeah. If I mean, that's the logic behind this: is that you can't have, you can't have people married in one state and not in another because of discrimination based on uh, something that is not relevant. It's just not relevant in this case. Uh, so I think that what we have to do in North Carolina right now is do that one-on-one communication. Work at the municipal levels to institute domestic partnerships. Um, uh, have more corporations show that they are anti-discriminatory in nature. I think a lot of that could have happened during the Amendment 1 campaign, but you did not see a lot of corporations come out strongly uh, to show right. we've been hiring these people and nothing's happened. <laughs> well, they wrote a little bit, but it wasn't, it wasn't it, as strong. It wasn't yeah, as strong yeah, as it could was, have been. Well, and getting back to our conversation earlier, uh, if gun control Control might be a surrogate for deeper anxieties that and social tensions that we're not willing to talk about. Do you think that uh, the polarization over gay marriage and gay rights is also an expression of deeper anxieties, social anxieties among the so-called mainstream that that aren't being handled about their own condition and uh, place in this society? That are uh, that we have a surrogate conversation about about gender rights. Uh, yeah, well, I think that that's one issue. Immigration is another issue. I think there's several issues where there's a an unease in the majority community that they are somehow going to lose something if these are addressed. That something is going to fundamentally change about their economic situation or their uh, belief system that is is challenging and frightening. And I think that is a, just another thing that adds to the stressors. Right. That people, they have to grapple with things that are larger than themselves. But you might think that this that you wouldn't be so anxious about those things if there wasn't already some threat, if there wasn't some already some economic threat or threat about your fundamental beliefs that that was pre-existing for these kinds of conversations to trigger such such vitriol and such a polarized view. If you're secure in your economic standing, if you're secure in your religious beliefs, then you would think you wouldn't have to go to war over this. Yeah, well, but, you know, look at the... (laughs) Look what happened with Bull Connor and dogs being sicked on people <laughs> because right. we're black. I mean, I think that it just depends on what, what the topic is. But I think that there is always a challenging event or a series of events such as the progress of LGBT rights that will threaten some portion of the population. And as we've seen in the most recent polls, just over half of people approve of, of same-sex marriage. So that's come a long way in just a short time. So... Um, will I see it in my lifetime? I hope so, but I'm not counting on it, but I hope so. And I think that if people understand that their lives won't fundamentally change by talking about these issues, it's either we don't want to talk about it, you know, want to cover our ears and don't want to hear that there's change happening and just realize that all of these changes affect 
affect you anyway. I mean, it's much more important to worry about whether your job's going to get eliminated and shipped over to another country, right. uh, which is going to cause you a whole lot more insecurity from uh, at any level than whether or not two people of the same sex can get married. Well, I mean, I think that's the thing. You can imagine yourself sort of going to war with a gay couple better than going into the boardroom that just shipped your job overseas. Those are a bunch of rich guys, and they've got your life in the palm of their hands. These other folks, I might be able to deal with them. Just right. Wondering. And it feels like you can you have some control over it if yeah. you and your church can go and condemn the gay couple that tried to walk in and, and just sit down in your church. Uh, but I think that the political campaign in 2012 sort of highlighted the, the tension when Mitt Romney talked about the 47 percent. People – People started to realize, you know what? I think I am in the forty-seven <laughs> percent. <laughs> <laughs> it must mm-hmm. be me, yeah. and then realized that that forty percent, sorry, forty-seven percent is pretty high. I mean, there's, it's even higher than that. How many people take advantage of some portion of the government? I mean, we all benefit right. from the roads and bridges. Mm-hmm. I mean, so it it, it caused people to, some pause to think, well, who am I really voting against or for? Um, it would, I wish the election had been more of a landslide than it was, but I think that that made people stop and think about where they are on the on the spectrum of success or what we thought was success in America. And who's responsible really for their insecurity? Who, right. Who's really threatening their livelihoods, their family? I mean, you'd feel completely out of sorts knowing that, you know, some guy in a bank somewhere just you know foreclosed on your home and you can't do anything about it because you were given a loan uh, that was basically, you know, juggled around until the, hu- the whole right. house fell down. <laughs> well, and, and they've committed felonies. I mean, it's interesting yes. to see how many felonies the banks have committed. You just don't see their faces on the nightly news in those boxes wanted, you know, and, and mm-hmm. it, it, if you'd see some banker's face, because it's felony, it's yes. a crime, you wonder how your vision of who's victimizing you might change if it wasn't somebody in an orange jumpsuit, you know, with a, with a, who needs a haircut, but it's a guy in a really nice haircut. That's right. Really nice haircut, nice suit, and, um, you know, had a golden parachute, but you're left with no job. You're, you know, the, the walls are closing in on you economically, and that that kind of um, lack of stability is what gets at family issues and family violence. And, you know, you come full circle back to what happened in Newtown. It's interesting to look back at your life and career and, and look ahead as well. You've really straddled these divides between old and new, old technology, new technology, civil rights for various uh, members of our and various communities who live among us. Uh, I mean, do you, do you see it that way? And how do you navigate all of these, these identities and changes? Well, I think the the changes, if you just look at put the blogger hat on, um, I think that people have migrated from reading long form journalism in <laughs> online, which would be blogging, long blog, to the social media, and so I try to straddle those two worlds. Uh, meanwhile, you know, in my day job at Duke University Press, you know, I'm still experiencing and witnessing the changes in publishing technology. Um, over time and the fact that people have migrated to starting reading books and journals on a Kindle or in different formats than what we thought would be. Um, and, And those technology changes can sometimes be frightening. Pam, pleasure to talk with you. Thank you for coming in. Thank you, Frank. Pam Spaulding, editor of pamshouseblend.com. Our program is called The State of Things. You can find us at stateofthings.org, and this is North Carolina Public Radio, a broadcast service of the University of North Carolina Chapel Hill. I'm Frank Stacio.